It's based upon the Frankfurt Resolution. Google this stuff, Frankfurt Resolution, ECDP, European Union of Drug Policy. Happened to be a whole bunch of good drug czars around Europe who got together, got along with one another, and pushed this stuff forward. It got a reaction as well. But you know what happened? The price of success, that the Europeans were so successful, that essentially they reduced their drug problem from a big problem to a very manageable small problem. There's not the big open air drug markets that are freaking out the tourists and the bankers and the cops and everybody else anymore, right? You, you know, in, in the Netherlands, the average age of an injecting heroin user may be 40 now or something. There's almost no new users coming in, right? There's new issues emerging. There's problems with organized crime, getting into certain drug markets and, and this sort of stuff. But it's all kind of, hey, it's OK now. It's okay, we got bigger issues, you know, our immigrant crate issue, this issue, that issue, uh, economy, right? The drug issue, and the problem is that the Europeans have lost their fire, right? And they've lost their fire on reform. In fact, on the, interesting, on the marijuana thing, what happened, I think, on the marijuana thing over here was that when Washington, Colorado did it, and then Uruguay did it, and all of a sudden the Dutch would be kind of stuck with their coffee shop system for 30 years, went, Holy, you know, we've been left behind. <laughs> and then like the Swiss and the Danes and the Czechs and the Spanish were like, whoa, 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 they're ahead of us? And so all of a sudden these incredible discussions in Spain, you got a thousand coffee shops now, like the Netherlands in Spain, especially in the Basque and uh, Catalan regions, right? The Czechs are talking about this stuff, the Danes and the Swiss are looking at something local. So they've been provoked to do something a little better and get out of their kind of not really moving at all. But on the other stuff, the problems have become so much more manageable that you have very little talk about sort of legalization. And the fact of the matter is, look, what, what are we aspiring for in the US? On some level, we all aspire to get where the Europeans have gone, right? We're basically getting closer and closer to a real decriminalization of drug possession, where the Portuguese have done it in a significant way, where others are doing it, you know, to one degree or another, where you've got heroin agents, small but working, you've got extensive access to opioid substitution, you've got methadone, buprenorphine, you've got that, you've got safe injection sites, you've got needles there, you've got stuff integrated to national healthcare system, you have a number of overdose fatalities, I mean, problem in England, maybe a few other places, but not great, you know, I mean, it's all kind of, we're aspiring, that's a huge bar of success. But keeping in mind the cost of that kind of success is it takes away the the, 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 the diamond. Last couple of things on the UN thing. Um, well, I'll come back to a second. The marijuana thing, as I said, is the single most dynamic thing. And what the US did has had a catalytic effect. People in Mexico tell me the only way to really shock and pop open the debate in Mexico is for California to legalize marijuana, right? Uh, I said, what about Colorado, Washington? That help, California. I mean, if you can do it in Texas, all the better, but Texas is Texas, and they don't even have to So California, right? I mean, the, they all say that. When Jerry Brown flew down to, to, to Mexico last month, I actually lived up sitting next to him on a plane going down. I said, what are you gonna, gonna meet with the president? But, yeah, so what are you gonna say if he asks you about marijuana legalization in marijuana California? Goes, I don't know. Well, sure enough, the next day, he meets with President Peña Nieto. He know what's going to happen with California? The all, what's going to happen? Jerry Brown says, I think it'll be on the ballot. I think it'll win. And doesn't say anything bad. I mean, he thinks marijuana legalization is going to be the, the, the downfall of American society. But it's, I think he's still not going to be a problem with stuff, right? <laughs> but, but, but the fact is, is that, is that, is that, that the only thing forcing the Mexican president to think about this is that, oh my god, what if California legalizes? And then we're going to keep like pulling up plants and locking up people. And has, I mean, the, 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 the contradiction becomes too great there, right? And that spills over, right? I mean, even you look at, we just organized a delegation from Colombia to look at the medical marijuana, medical marijuana thing in, in Denver, right? And we brought Mexicans and Uruguayans and Canadians over. I mean, there's all this kind of interaction that builds interest in Costa Rica, stuff's going on in Argentina, stuff's going on in Chile. It's all being shaped by looking at what people in North America are doing now, right? So it's got all this wonderful international spillover. The second catalytic thing going on globally is the Latin American elite. It's so paradoxical. In the US, it is the people at the level of ballot initiative and the state government leading the charge and the politicians cautiously beginning to follow from behind. Right? Yesterday, Senator Merkley from Oregon 
said publicly he thinks he's going to vote for the marijuana legalization initiative. Just about the first time ever the U.S. Senate has done that. Hmm. I found he might have done it because he was at an event with Joe Biden, and the <laughs> Congressman Blumenauer, was at, well, who's been our ally there, was talking about the marijuana issue, and that got the biggest standing ovation of the entire Biden Merkley when he's just said event. Oh my God. And that maybe this was going to take to mobilize his base to show up, right? That's sort of what's happening there, right? But the, in the Latin America, it's the elite driving this thing, and the public kind of like, you know, in a bit of a daze going, yeah, 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 what? You know? <laughs> it's, like, it's like you do polling about even just like legalized marijuana in Guatemala, in Mexico, Uruguay. Columbia, you're lucky to break 30%, 35% saying they want to legalize marijuana, right? You, you have people in Mexico saying legalization is just about empowering and enriching the drug lords. Now, on one hand, that seems like, what are you, crazy? I mean, this is what you do take away the money and the power. Think rationally about this. Then again, in Mexico, where many people think that the distinction between organized crime and the government is not all that noticeable, you can understand why some of them think that way, right? But there's a bigger systemic thing, which is that the things that criminal organizations, you know, the reason why criminal organizations don't typically make the transition into being very successful legal entrepreneurs is because the way that they became big as criminal organizations is because they were expert in the employment of violence and intimidation, right, and corruption. They were not expert in mass production and efficiencies and marketing, et cetera, right? So they're not, when, when, they, when we get legalization, their ability to compete against companies like alcohol, tobacco, pharmaceutical, consumer good companies, it's going to be tough for them. A few will make the transition, but not, you know. So rationally speaking, you have that on there. But what happened was, beginning in 2007, I've been part of this since the very beginning. I mean, uh, the first meeting in 2007, which led to the creation of the Latin American Commission on Drugs and Democracy, which organized its former presidents, Cardoso Brazil, Gaviria Colombia, Zedillo Mexico, and a whole bunch of famous Nobel Prize winning writers and former ministers and newspaper publishers. In 2009, they come out with a report saying, break the taboo. We need a basically different drug policy, but they're cautious. Then they decide to expand the commission and make it a global commission on drug policy. And these same three presidents, former presidents, Cardoso Gaviria Zio, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico, all from the kind of the center right, right? Not the real right, the center right and not the left, right? They expand it out. And they get other former presidents, Ruth Dreyfus from Switzerland. They get uh, Javier Solana, former EU like you know, security minister. They get Richard Branson. George Shultz, the former Republican Secretary of like, you know, everything, right? I mean, <laughs> Paul, Paul, Paul Volcker, the former, you know, Federal Reserve Board Chair. Uh, Kofi Annan, former U.S. Secretary General, not known as being a bold leader, a cautious guy. But he signs on because he sees how basically parts of West Africa are like kind of following like lemmings in the steps of Central America towards massive narco violence and corruption and narco state in this, right? So they all sign on to this thing. And in 2011, come out with a report that basically says, yes, break the taboo. The prohibition regime is a major part of the problem. We've got to legalize marijuana and regulate it responsibly. We have to uh, do heroin maintenance and safe injection. We've got to end the criminalization of drug possession. And then they even do say things like, we've got to consider ending the criminalization of low-level sale and of smuggling and of the mules and not criminalizing that. And it's like, whoa. I mean, Pretty radical, right? And then, bing, bing, and that report gets fantastic press. We organized a press conference, the world of a story in 2011. We got luck, no other big news that day. And it's, but it's the first time this stuff is being discussed in newspapers and media in, in Asia and Africa, not just Europe, mm -hmm. Latin America, and the US, right? Big. And then right after it, like Jimmy Carter writes an op-ed, and Jesse Jackson, who had been a leading drug warrior, he jumps on board. He doesn't quite have the talking points now, but still. <laughs> It's like happening, right? And then other presidents, and so they start to build, they get the former president of Chile, Lagos, and of Poland, and of, uh, I mean, a whole bunch of other good guys, and they sign on, and then last month, last month, September, new Global Commission report, and unbelievably, it more or less comes out for legalization. They don't use the word, but they say we need to move in the direction or actually do the legal regulation of all drugs or as many drugs as absolutely possible. And there are commissioners who thought that all along, but are finally willing to say it. 
And there are global commissioners who haven't thought that way, but during the process actually come along and join that. And there, I mean, it's a really remarkable thing to see these 70, and mostly people in their 70s and 80s, embracing this radical statement. And even the ones like George Schultz and Paul Volcker and a bunch of the others, I say if you polled the commission, probably most of them would actually endorse how radical the report was, but they were all willing to stick with it and keep their names on it. So that's out there. Now, after the 2011 report came out, the first big global fish report, they're all going like, well, it's all good for ex-presidents to say it, right? And when people go, why didn't you say it when you're president? Well, fair enough. So, you know, there's a zillion ex-presidents, but only a handful of ex-presidents will actually come out and say, I actually was wrong then. Here's what I think now. And maybe I did or maybe I didn't think it before. But now I'm going to say it. And so like when Bill Clinton like, you know, you know, goes, goes up and gives speeches at the AIDS conference, other ones say, I'm sorry about what I didn't do the needle exchange, I'm sorry about the mass incarceration, I'm sorry about opposing medical marijuana, I'm sorry. You know what? Yes, Bill, I wish you'd been better then, it would have made a big difference. <laughs> but the fact that you're willing to be good now counts for a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't hear George Bush getting good, <coughs> either of the Bushes getting good on this stuff, you know? It counts when somebody's willing to say they were wrong, you know, and come out in that way. It's very rare that you get a guy like Sanjay Gupta, you know, who kind of comes out and before he does his new marijuana report last year, actually does interviews saying, I was wrong, and I was wrong not because his new research, I was wrong because I didn't do the work I should have done back then. That kind of acknowledgement that you, live, you wish for the day that a politician would do that, right? It just doesn't happen, right? It's not part of their DNA. But the fact is, after the whole issue comes out, you've got Santos in Colombia who've been tiptoeing and he said. And then a right wing former military general, head of intelligence in Guatemala, right, comes and he gets elected at the end of 2011. One of the first things he does is, is I think we need to talk about and maybe even actually legalize drugs, right? This right wing, right wing guy, military, you know, and he's saying it, and he seems to be committed to it, right? It's not just a cynical ploy. And then you got from the left wing, Correa, the left wing Chavista president of Ecuador, who boycotts the uh, summit of the Americas because Cuba's not invited, and the next day gives an interview saying that he, the left wing Chavista Correa from Ecuador, thinks that the bravest president in America is Otto Perez Molina, the right-wing military general, maybe involved in war crimes, right-wing guy, right? Because of his gussiness in calling for a debate on the drug stuff. And Correa says, I'm a little inhibited to talk about it because my dad was locked up in American prison on drug dealing charges. So it's kind of, you know, but I'm glad he is and I support what he's doing, right? So you have, and then more heat. You know, this former gorilla, 78-year-old, says whatever's on his mind, president of Uruguay, right? <laughs> you know, looks, looks out of his Volvo or something, right? And he, he, he comes out and he says, he says to his advisors, what should we do about this marijuana issue? And his advisors say, well, the best policy would be to legally regulate it. That's not politically possible. And Malika says, hey, I'd like to be president for 40 years. Let's just do it. It's the right thing to do. And he leaves it forward. DPA and other organizations get involved in helping as much as possible, and as you all saw, Uruguay moves that way. Uruguay is a little like the Dutch. They say, we just want to do our own thing. We don't want to tell anybody else what to do. And we're saying, will you open your damn mouths? I mean, talk about what you're doing. You're leaders. No, 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 we're Uruguay, we're the Dutch. We don't want to lead, you know. We just want to do our thing. Leave us alone. Right? But the, the fact that they're doing it is help moving things along. Meanwhile, the guys like Otto Perez and Santos, they don't want to talk about drug policy reform in their own countries because the public is so opposed. But whenever they go outside, they're talking about it, right? And they actually help lead to this ungas that's coming up right now. So what's going on right now on the international level is we have some Latin American leaders who want to lead, not all of them will be office then, right? And then at the same time, you have this, uh, you know, the Europeans who just don't seem all that animated. And I was meeting with a Mexican ambassador to the UN a few days ago, and he said, we need help, we need help. And I said, well, you got to lead. And he goes, like, and I said, I said to him, kind of partly provocatively, partly like really asking, have the Latin Americans ever led on anything? And he doesn't have an answer, right? Which is a reflective of the global power balance, but it's a mindset that Latin Americans sort of don't lead in a way, you know? And it's, you know 
And so that's part of the problem we have right now is how to move this stuff forward and build out the coalition between Latin America and, uh, and the Europeans who aren't animated and sort of agree with the US being flexible, but they don't want to, they're just saying, we're opening the door, we're not going to help you open it further, we're not going to squeeze it tighter, we're just saying the door's a little open and we're just like, that's it. Not going to help, not going to hurt, <laughs> okay? So I think, and I'll finish with the UN strategy and go back into this more harm reduction stuff. stuff. I think what's going to happen with 2016 and the young gas, which is this big moment that all drug policy reformers worldwide are trying to mobilize and how to take advantage of, what's going to happen is this. The international drug control system, driven by the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, is going to dominate this process. They've already been given the control of it. You know, the Global Commission met with the UN Secretary General, said, can't you at least help us to get all the other UN agencies, like UN AIDS and WHO and UN Refugees and UN Human Rights, to like, play a role, because they all more agree with reform. And the Secretary said, yeah, 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 OK, I'll see what I can do. But it's the UNODC is owning this thing out of Vienna. They're going to make sure that nothing significant happens. So I think, uh, but, but our advantage, I mean, we have to do everything we can to influence governments, move the thing, work the international, work the, the capitals and all this. But here's our opportunity. It's on the public front. It's on the media front. The UN is going to spend a huge amount of money to bring all these presidents and others together in New York in the spring of 2016. But their message is going to be so boring. <laughs> They're going to have nothing new to say, right? Meanwhile, our message is exciting. It's sort of what we did in 98, you know? And we can do it, I hopefully, again, maybe in a bigger way. It's to hijack the public media. So they'll all come to the UN. They got everything wired, all this sort of stuff. And then we, right, the media, our media, and all this sort of stuff, we hijack the media coverage of this thing. And what that means is that what we emphasize is any little seed for the future reform or harm reduction, we're blowing up, right? The fact that the 98 thing, the, the 2016 ungas, whatever comes out, is going to be so weak that it's going to be pathetic. But you know what? Compared to 1998, it's going to look like a radical step forward. 1998, the motto of the invention was a drug-free world, we can do it, right? <laughs> and the same objective was to cut drug consumption in half, right? I mean, you know, lunacy, right? Lunacy, I mean, it's just, the 2016 thing is not going to say that. It is going to be greater realism in a very conservative tone. So I think we can emphasize the reform, and for me, in a way, the, the whole 2016 thing is about hijacking and manipulating as much as we can, given our lesser power around the system, and planning for the next on gas in 2028 or 2030, where we hopefully will truly revamp this thing. Because as I've been saying since I got involved in this, we are in a three-generation struggle. Drug policy reform, like gay rights, like civil rights, like women's rights, all these are basically three-generation struggles. In some respects, longer, but three key generations. And we are just now entering the second generation. Right? That's, the, I, that's the way I think about drug policy reform and, and how we are realistic about our objectives and how we think strategically in the long term. Now, where does the more traditional harm reduction fit into all this stuff? Those are the two catalytic things going on, right? And obviously, the Global Commission, this sort of stuff is a kind of over, it embraces the marijuana and the harm reduction, the criminal justice reform, the whole drug policy reform agenda with very much of a harm reduction ethos helping drive it. And the former president of Switzerland, Ruth Dreyfus, has just played this pivotal role in making this happen and educating the Latin Americans about the European harm reduction thing. If you look at the other pieces of this thing, you know, what's happened is, in a way, <coughs> needle exchange, right, going back to the 80s, was a sort of catalytic moment, right? You know, first the Dutch and the Australians and showing that could work. Um, then Margaret Thatcher, surprisingly, saying, you know, with a very reactionary approach on drugs, but saying we have to prioritize stopping the spread of the deadly diseases, we have to cure over stopping drug addicts from doing their thing, right? And so embracing in the mid 80s, this sort of stuff. And that, because, see, one way to think about the strategy of drug policy reform is that every incremental reform we pursue, we essentially pursue for two reasons, right? We pursue needle exchange for two reasons. First, because the evidence showed that it was an effective way of reducing the spread of HIV without increasing drug use, right? Secondly, because it transformed the injecting drug user from a deviant criminal to be persecuted and prosecuted into a potential partner in a public health campaign to stop the spread of a deadly disease. 
That transformation, the identification of the addicting drug user from deviant person to be persecuted and prosecuted to potential partner in a health campaign who we want to bring above ground, right? It's a radical thing. That was the right. What, what marijuana has been in the last few years in the Global Commission, that's what needle exchange and the emergence of harm reduction, which has sort of bubbled along and really blossomed with that, was in the 80s. It was the catalytic moment. And from that emerged the safe injection site thinking, the heroin maintenance thinking, and all of those sort of, I mean, they had some of their antecedents, but that was the dominant, the dominant thing there, right? Now we know that the needle exchange thing has really kind of, it's been institutionalized in some respects, it's bogged down in other respects. We have this horrible situation in the US with the Congress, you know, briefly allowing federal funding and then pulling it back, and the actions of it still in the South and all of this sort of stuff, right? But it's still there, it's institutionalization, and it led to the institutionalization of the harm reduction in Europe and some parts of the developing world and some parts of the US and in Canada, you know, and it's not insignificant part of the world, right? You know, the fact if somebody said to you 12 years ago that, you know, you know, I envision the day when Malaysia, Indonesia, China, Vietnam, and Iran are going to have needle change and methadone programs, and they would have said, you know, what are you, crazy, dreaming, fantasy land? Mm -hmm. And yet, within a few years, already, as of five, six years ago, every one of those countries has needle change and methadone maintenance in a, fair, a very repressive environment, but doing it because they're freaked out about AIDS. Right? And you actually have nine years ago the, the Ayatollah in Iran, who's in charge of, I think, the Justice Ministry, issuing a fatwa declaring that needle exchange and methadone maintenance are, are okay under Sharia law. Right? I mean, it's remarkable. <laughs> but it was, it was flipping out about the possible spread of AIDS that led them to do that, and health ministry folks and international folks go in there and helping that happen. So that's happening there. The safe injection thing and the heroin maintenance thing, those things. You know, they continue to be really important, and I believe that in the U.S. context, they are pivotally important, right? Now, I personally think that between the two, we're, DPA is working on both, HRC is working, I think, on both, especially on safe injection. Other organizations are doing this sort of stuff, right? And we, we're getting it some traction in a few places around safe injection. Maybe, maybe San Francisco, something will happen. Maybe Seattle, something will happen. Maybe New York, will something happen. In New Mexico, we got through a resolution by the state legislature saying for, calling for a study of, of safe injection. So there's some stuff going on. I think the heroin maintenance is the more catalytic one, if we can do it. And I know that from a harm reduction perspective, there's a greater empathy, a sympathy for safe injection, because it's more consistent with harm reduction principles, right? It's taking, injecting drug users where they're at, it's saying, here's clean needles, and by the way, here we're gonna have a room in the back where you can do it, and da 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 We're not gonna deal with the big issues of where you get your drugs from, but we're gonna humanize you in that current condition. And heroin maintenance, it's a government licensed program, or a study, or whatever. It's a more control thing, right? And the ways in which, you know, part of the ethos and ideology of harm reduction is sort of antithetical to the control piece of the public health system, right? The kind of human rights, you know, people's uh, independence, and, and, you know, and the notion that you're going to go to this program and you can't take it home, and there's doctors, and they, you know, it, it's not. But in terms of public consciousness, I think heroin maintenance is the more catalytic. And it's also the one that's easier for law enforcement to get their hands around, right? Harm reduction struggles with, I'm sorry, policing struggles with things that exist in the gray area of the law. For them, needle exchange, safe injection, medical marijuana, a lot of that goes in the harm reduction world where it's still illegal, but you kind of pull back and you tolerate illegal activity because public health should be trumping public, you know, what they define as public safety or law enforcement, strict enforcement of laws, right? They, it, they, they just are uncomfortable with it. The whole thing is just kind of, you know, all they can finally be forced to go along with it and not interfere with needle change safe injection, but they're not fully comfortable with it. Heroin maintenance, and one can make the same argument for marijuana legalization, except that it raises an existential issue for the cops, because when you take away marijuana prohibition, their principal connection to the drug war and to doing their stuff and how they relate to young men of especially color just gets taken away, right? But in heroin maintenance, it's like a controlled system. It's not a public safety. And what you saw is that when police in, when police in um, Europe, in the big cities, and then the small cities, 
went from like, what are you, crazy? You're gonna give the junkies junk? Why don't you just give the alcoholics booze and everything else? To like, oh wait a second, heroin maintenance, totally legal regulated system, it reduces um, you know, inclusive of crime by drug addicts, it reduces black markets, and it actually is all approved by the public health folks. You mean it's like a win-win-win for us? Mm -hmm. And all we gotta do is let go of that kind of, you know, you know, bigotry against drug users? I mean, uh, maybe we can do that. I mean, we already sort of warmed this up with the safe injection meal chain. Well, yeah, this is what's better than us, right? That light bulb that goes off in the minds of law enforcement and a whole bunch of other people when all of a sudden you realize that if you allow people who have been addicted continually or on and off to street heroin to access it in a clinic where they can't take it home but access it with services and help, I think it causes a transformation in thinking about the nature of addiction, about the ways we, we, we categorize and, and compartmentalize heroin addiction from alcohol addiction or cigarette addiction from cocaine addiction, all these sorts of things. It causes people to think again. Like, well, what we, you mean, you mean, what we think about, a, a, what, what, what comes to mind for us about a junkie is not about the heroin, it's actually about the system. You mean when you give people pharmaceutical heroin, they stop being a junkie and they actually can get a job and function and be, you know, all that. And that revolutionary notion, I, I think it's one of those, like, you know, I think it's the kind of come to Jesus thing that we can talk. It's the reason I believe that heroin maintenance is so important, even though it'll never be for a large number of people, and even though for all sorts of political and other reasons, it's going to be only for those people for whom methadone and buprenorphine have not worked until a day in the future when actually people get to choose what it is they want to be able to consume, right? But until that day, it's going to be for the ones who everything else didn't work. But that thing, right, having that pop go off, and I've been desperate to try to figure out a way to make that pop go off in the U.S. for like ever since I've been involved in this stuff, right? I don't know if you know, back in like 19, early 70s, the Vera Institute, a relatively mainstream public policy think tank in New York, put out a big report about heroin maintenance, a favorable report, and it got shot down, you know, by all sorts of people, especially including African American leaders in Harlem, basically calling this a form of chemical genocide, right? If methadone was the was the white man's chemical bracelet on the black man, heroin was the real, you know. And you know, meanwhile, National League of Cities. The black mayor of Gary, Indiana, Richard Hatcher, introduced a resolution in the National League of Cities in the early 70s saying that we need to move forward on heroin maintenance, and it passes, right? And then what happens is it just never goes anywhere. Everything just kind of falls off and drops. But there was this early period in the 70s where people talked about this stuff, and it just disappeared, right? When I look at uh, Botticelli, right, yesterday, I mean, I think on the one hand, this is compared to what we've had before, to have the U.S. drugs are coming up there, and he's basically talking our language about not incarcerating people for drug possession, and naloxone, they went from tiptoeing on it to being a leader on naloxone access, and he's talking about stigma and prejudice, and he's talking about legal exchange, I think he even used the word harm reduction, and I'm going, this is, I mean, compared to what we had before the last 25 years, this is like music, and the fact that a guy coming out of health background in Boston can, you know, do, it is beautiful. And then the other part of me goes, you know, why do you guys keep saying that shit? You didn't say it here. But on marijuana, you sound like a freak. You know? I mean, you sound like, you know, Reefer Magnus, William Bennett, and Crumb. I mean, they're all like this marijuana nonsense. Like, you know, I mean, just anti science, anti anything rational. But, like, somehow you feel compelled to keep saying that. Is actually the White House telling that you need to do that to balance off the good stuff that holds you to the job? What's that? And secondly, how come. The evidence of safe injection heroin maintenance is it. There is no debate anymore. The only evidence is everything reduces, you know, use of other illicit drugs, reduces HIV and Hep C risk behavior, reduces, uh, you know, overdose, reduces arrest, reduces crime, it's a next and then benefit for the taxpayer. And no drugs are were ever once mentioned the word or had a night or mentioned heroin maintenance or safe injection. But that's where you know Obama's commitment to this administration will not let science be trumped by politics? Yeah, right, right? You guys don't have the guts to find a way to let that thing happen when the evidence is conclusive. My San Francisco director, Laura Thomas, was trying to find people, you know, researchers to move forward in the U.S., and they were saying, look, we don't, we, we agree, yeah, but why? 
I mean, A, the evidence is already in from Europe, so what's the interesting questions anymore? And B, we're just going to get battered and waste our time vis-a-vis -vis national sort of drug abuse or whatever. So, you know, and we, we, that level of hopelessness. There was a tiny little breakthrough, by the way. Last month, I was in Nevada, and I ended up having a dinner with this state legislator, uh, Tick Seeger. Blom, I think his name is, who comes from a long, multi-generation Democratic political family. He's been leading the stuff on marijuana. Very strong, though, left labor connections, but connected with the marijuana industry. Very interesting guy. In his 60s, white guy. And, and, and I'm, I tell him how my passion is this Harold Maine scene in the US. And he goes, oh, I can do a bill on that. I can do a bill on anything at the bottom. I said, really? And I thought he was just like blown smoke at me. Anyway, he then announces to the press, and we did a radio show last Thursday. On a radio show where he says, oh yes, I'm going to introduce a bill to introduce heroin and it's in Nevada. Right? And now DP is helping him draft a bill. Anyway, I know it's not going to go anywhere, but this is how you get the conversation started. And I kept thinking, the only way to do this is to get a professor and a treatment, you know, a researcher like they did in Canada and Europe, get the researcher, do it as a research program, you know, blah, blah, blah. But now a legislator actually wants to promote the discussion. So I, I, I continue to think that we have to keep moving forward on safe injection and open that thing up for a whole bunch of good reasons. But then if we could pop it in the US on heroin maintenance, that would be fantastic. Now, to flip back, I said before, we always do things for two reasons, right? Because it accomplishes a specific good needle change, needle change. If you think about medical marijuana, why do we do medical marijuana beginning in 95, 96? Two reasons, right? Because first of all, you know, that, 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 that the most egregious aspect of the war on marijuana is the persecution and prosecution of people who use marijuana really for medical purposes, right? And so that they have the moral right to be first in line to get access to that, right? And the second reason is because by moving forward on legalization of medical marijuana, we transform the broader public dialogue around marijuana. You know, also in the media, instead of showing, you know, a 17-year-old, you know, you know, kid with, you know, you know, you know, hemp leaves in his blonde dreadlocks, you know, you know, the, the, every parent's fear of their high school drug addict they want their kid to hang out with, right? You know, all of a sudden it becomes the person in their 40s, 50s, 60s, or 70s who's using it for their for their AIDS wasting or their chemotherapy or their, their neuroskeletal disease or MS or whatever, right? You transform the discussion. Medical marijuana, almost certainly, we can't prove it, but almost certainly the reason why marijuana legalization took off the way it is is because of what we changed in the dialogue of medical marijuana. With naloxone and Good Samaritan, 911 Good Samaritan laws, right? Why? Well, it reduces the number of people dying. That's bottom line. But what else does it do? As the needle exchange, as the safe injection, as the medical marijuana, it carves out another little refuge or oasis from the prohibitionist system. In each one of these things, what needle exchange did, and safe injection did, and heroin maintenance does, and medical marijuana does, they pop out little oases from the prohibition system where somebody's an injecting drug user or a marijuana consumer or whatever can actually go, oh, I'm safe here. I'm safe here. The prohibition <laughs> system, it's like, it's like sanctuary in a church. You know what I mean? It's that element of distance. And when the locks of the Samaritan does the same thing, it said, here's this space that now where the cops show up and there's heroin around and an overdose, 911 Good Samaritan says, you don't arrest those people unless there's major criminal activity of guns around, right? Depending on the law, how good it is, right? But it does you don't do that. That's another little, and every time we're looking, we're always looking with these things, the incremental reform that can be justified on public health and public safety grounds, to get into that space, open it up to save the specific people, and then open it up further in order to open up the broader dialogue around harm reduction and drug policy reform. And that's a sort of deeper political strategy of all this stuff. Now, I think that Naloxone is doing that stuff. And so, when I look at it, you know, having the cops carry it. I understand there's problematic issues with that. You know, but on the other hand, the fact that a cop is going from put the handcuffs on a guy who's not breathing to give him the locks on, big step forward, right? <laughs> so there was just a meeting earlier this year that some of my colleagues went to of senior police leaders from around the country. And the two most interesting things at that meeting were, on the one hand, they were flipping out around marijuana legalization. Even though it was going to reduce crime, do all these sort of positive public safety things, it was creating an existential dilemma for cops. It was like, I mean, half of all our drug arrests are like marijuana. Like, two thirds of our possession arrests or whatever are marijuana. Like, how are we going to relate to young men of color in this country if we can't ask them for marijuana? <laughs> 
exercise our power. And it was about it was about professional organizational state versus the citizen, and it was also about interpersonal power between the police officer. You know, when you know that a significant percentage of all young people in this country might have marijuana in their pocket, it gives you immense power vis-a-vis -vis that person. And take mm -hmm. that away, a whole big basis of your interpersonal power and law enforcement power is diminished, right? So they're having an existential and also they're talking about the, the, the public health risk of legalization. Cops talking about public health risk, I mean, how cynical can you be, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. On the other hand, naloxone, if you can be life rather than put a handcuff on, we want to do it. It was like they're owning this thing. Step up, I think, if I'm going to give Krolikowski one big plus for something, he started off in, you know, basically, you know, you know, this is a disappointment in so many ways. I think a cop coming out of Seattle would have been a lot better on stuff, you know? I mean, you know, you know Krolikowski, actually, Seattle, like the biggest tent fest in the world, right? I mean, you think that, where was that when he became drug czar? Krolikowski paid a visit to the safe injection site in Vancouver before he became drug czar and wrote a very objective memo about it. Not a peep about that. Right? Mm -hmm. Comes in, the locks on you. know, I, I have my staff, and I think they're the same thing. We're following him around. Like, he shows up anyplace where we give him our like overdose book, all this stuff. <laughs> but by the time he steps up, he has become a champion, like leapfrogging beyond all the other federal agencies and actually being really good on this stuff. And Botticelli, even better. He was doing it before, I think, in Boston, right? And so that is a wonderful thing forward. Now, the debates going on within the harm reduction world is like, is like the whole the locks of overdose thing like dominating, you know, like, like is there an internal thing in harm reduction around naloxone and overdose, like we're having with marijuana and drug policy reform, like this wonderful thing that's happening is actually just kind of taking all the oxygen and everything else? I don't know, I, I've just been hearing about some of this stuff. I think, obviously, any way we can increase access to naloxone, the law that the DPA worked on this and, and others worked on this, first in Vermont and now in California, were basically over-the-counter naloxone, right? So yes, in the hands of cops, the version was the notion that anybody being given a prescription for a strong painkiller, right, should be getting a naloxone thing and some, you know, some information about this, and ultimately over-the-counter availability, or if not over-the-counter, at least non-prescription. You know, between over-the-counter and prescription is kind of like behind the counter. Like we have to ask for it, right? The way they've done syringes or condoms or sometimes different places like that, which is fine, right? But the naloxone, that norm, and allowing that to be made available, right? I mean, I, you know, it, it is, I gotta give a shout out to Lindsay. Just raise your hand because Lindsay has been drafting, <laughs> not drafting. I think she's become the expert drafter in the country <laughs> on the locks of availability and on Good Samaritan, just like her colleague Tam Artai has become the expert on drafting medical marijuana, marijuana decriminal legalization type stuff. And that type of expertise, knowing how you take the basic principles and apply them in the context of local law and which compromises are acceptable or worse, is actually fiddle this stuff. So the locks on thing I think is huge. But the key is now that you have the drugs are showing up at HRC. Right? He's not going to show up at DPA, but showing up at HRC, <laughs> which is funny because in some respects HRC is more radical than DPA, and I'm DPA is more radical than HRC, depending on which issue you're, you're dealing with, right? But the fact that he's showing up, the loss is a good thing, but once again, it's where, you know, that relationship, you got to keep pushing, right? DPA, we are simultaneously, and within a week of one another, Meeting with de Blasio, senior people, criminal justice people, et cetera, about embracing a more European, holistic, public health, harm reduction orientation, and all this stuff. And then we're putting out a report that's in a lot of the news today about slamming him on the fact that the marijuana rates are just as high under him and Bradman as they were under Bloomberg and Kelly, and the racial disproportionality is just as bad as well. And then the next day, we're going back to meet with him again, right? And it's like, I mean, that way you do that. And that's, I think, for the harm reduction world. Yeah, Botticelli, go to the zone. Botticelli, you move it on safe injection, how many, is all the other things about harm reduction that are typically important, right? So I think that piece of the thing is absolutely pivotal, this sort of stuff. The interesting thing, though, with most of the harm reduction stuff is, Going back to the National Convention stuff, you don't really need to change, I mean, it would help, but changing the National Conventions, the Europeans already showed that they could move forward on almost all the harm reduction they wanted without changing the National Conventions. Mm -hmm. And in part, that's because their governments had the confidence to say to the UN system, you got your wires, we got ours. Mm -hmm. The problem, of course, is that in the developing world, they don't have that confidence. 
They don't have the notion of, of, the, of the mojo to say, like, you got your laws, we got ours. They're much more deferential. It's one reason why international conventions, you know, the Europeans could do what they want, even maybe the Americans, but other parts of the world, there is going to be some need for change unless we can drive that a Mack truck through the flexibility thing to the point where the conventions really become less and less and less significant. So let me just finish with this piece and open it up um, for discussion, which is on the stuff that's going on right now, I continue, and we, we had a DPA uh, policy team retreat yesterday, I was talking to my colleagues about this. Our challenge, you know, people who get drawn to harm reduction in drug policy, typically I say, typically I say harm reduction in other drug policy reform, but I, it's because I put that overlap there, but just take it all as a holistic call there. What draws us to this, oftentimes, is our sense of righteousness, our desire to not be part of the system, and the authority, and the man, right? It's to be the rebel, the challenger, all of this. And sometimes what we don't know how to deal with emotionally and psychologically and existentially with is success, <laughs> right? It's weird. I mean, the drug czars up there yesterday, right? And a harm reduction conference. I mean, big. Other stuff. Senator, other talking about, I mean, on the marijuana field. I didn't get into the whole sentencing reform because I don't want to just talk the entire time, but, you know, I sometimes talk about, we've hit it, that I think last year we hit a tipping point on the marijuana issue in the U.S., but on the sentencing issue of mass incarceration, we have only hit a turning point. By which I mean, it's like trying to turn around the system of mass incarceration is like trying to turn around an ocean line. Right? You know, that you may point in a new direction, but it takes a long time before that thing really begins to turn around. I, I you know the numbers on the number of people locked up in US prisons and jails have been dropping by a few percent the last few years. And then last year it stayed flat. And I thought we'd have another big jump, but I maybe mean, big drop. But what I realized was that, I mean that, you know the system is so embedded and that many of the reformers are so incrementalist in their thinking. And you know that, that, that that's holding back the stuff, right? And meanwhile, how one deals with how one deals with, with 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 who we are as human beings being drawn to this, and what it means as some parts of our agenda become more and more mainstream, and how we live with that. I actually think that, and I said this to my colleagues yesterday or two days ago, that, that the number one thing that we as a movement need to get rolling very rapidly is our political skills and savviness. Because as we grow, and now there's more foundation funding coming in, so there's some elements of criminal justice reform, sentence reform, it's gonna, the thing's gonna keep growing. I mean, this conference has got a lot of people here, big stuff happening, people come from government on this. But how we build out our sophistication in building a movement, how we, because the toughest relationships inevitably are not with the opposition, they are with one another. They are with our allies within the same organizations and allied organizations with different agendas and all the conflicts that can emerge over tactics and strategy, over funding and credit and girlfriends and boyfriends and all that sort of stuff, <laughs> right? But I mean, all that stuff, how we grow as a movement is about how well we manage this, how well we take this to the next level. You know, I was giving this kind of like talk to my colleagues, and I'm saying, you know, you know, when would we think about sort of growing and building, growing power? How much any one of us is willing to get the notion of getting outside one's comfort zone, right? If you think about it, individually, or as an individual, as an organization, and as a movement, our capacity to be more effective has everything to do with our ability not just to make the most of the skills and talents and preferences we already have but to step outside our comfort zone and do that next level of stuff, that next level of engagement, that next level of personal organizational and movement maturity in order that we can grow ever more effective. Because the nuances of the issues that are emerging now, right? When we're getting, when you start getting the nitty gritty of how to regulate marijuana, the nitty gritty of diversion from the criminal justice system, or the nitty gritty of some harm reduction or locks on accessibility, or the political strategies or what compromises are acceptable, how much we can mature in our discussions and our ability to handle that with one another is going to be pivotal 
to how well we grow, right? I mean, I look forward to the day when our perspective truly is the dominant one in the United States and a growing number of countries around the world. I look forward to the day when the problems we're dealing with is people selling out and becoming part of the system. I look forward to the day when our people are getting promoted into the government positions and we're accusing them of selling out poor principles while they're trying to struggle with how they negotiate the real politics today so they can advance the principles they came from. I mean, that's going to be the kind of awkward celebration of our success. But that's what it's going to take. That's what it's going to take, right? I think that those issues, and that means that how we engage on the, the nuances of these issues, I also just think, and, I, and I'm going to step out a little bit on this stuff, how we engage around the issues of dealing with race in this movement, right? Because, but I'll say that the issues of race, I sometimes feel are being engaged, and they are highlighted at DPHRC and other progressive and conferences, and I sometimes worry that the dialogue that goes on around the issues of race which is right on it in terms of its penetrating analysis, but I'm not always clear that it's a thing that's helping advance the broader political agenda to the broader society, <laughs> right? The robustness of that debate, the robustness of people of color to have the same debates with people not of color that they have among themselves to open that sort of, sort of thing. Because what we bring to this is a level of penetrating analysis of the ways in which racism, institutionalized racism, and conscious and subconscious racism in our society stand in the way of so many things we're doing, the ways in which it's, there's a racial disproportionality to almost everything we deal with, right? And we understand that. But if that ever starts to become, if our analysis, if our interpretation of why progress is so hard ever starts to become an excuse or a reason for not moving for a far, further forward, forward, right? That too is going to be standing in the way of where we need to go in this sort of thing. Right? We can have no crutches, no crutches, ideological or personal crutches in moving forward. Right? And it means that the natural thing, when I look at marijuana ending within the drug policy reform movement or naloxone ending within the harm reduction movement, get over the ending. Look at how we take that and use it as a step forward and move outward from there. Right? When we argue over tactics and strategies and, and how much we're going to compromise, do it at that next level of sophistication, not at the ideologue versus the, versus the pragmatist. But the ideologue is informed by all the pragmatic evidence and arguments and vice versa. The pragmatist who's informed by the ideological vision. That's what it's going to take. And on that, I'm going to stop. <laughs> come to the Drug Policy Alliance Conference in D.C., actually Crystal City, a year from the 13 months from now. So make sure you're there. We're going to have some scholarship money available as well. Make sure you apply. You know, if you can do it without the scholarship money, God bless you, because then I'll bring more people there. But I want to say that. And anyway, comments, questions, anything at all, please. Yes, Howard. Ethan, uh, you know, I've been uh, doing harm reduction for 25 years. And, uh, but every time you go off, on heroin maintenance and injection sites, I'm, that's an uncomfortable zone for me. Uh -huh. And I'm a harm reductionist. First, I need you to make a distinction between safe injection site and heroin maintenance. If I'm not mistaken, on injection sites, people bring their own yes. Right. You're talking something else. Why I think Narcan has moved is because the concept, the idea of saving a life is powerful. <clears throat> now you have to take that and bring that into the safe injection heroin maintenance. That's the poof that you're look I think that you're looking for. That for me, harm reduction is, is engagement at a very early stage. And if the person's engaged, then we can help them. We can save a life. But if the, if the addict is in the underground and they're not engaged, nothing can happen. So harm reduction is that point of engagement. And you have to show injection sites, and I think, and heroin maintenance as a point of engagement to not only that all the other evidence is there, that the disease and, it, and it's, it's good in so many ways, but that it's also we can save a life. They may not be ready to turn their life around yeah. at that moment. Yeah. Well, Howard, I'll say this. I mean, you're right. 
I think that there's, a, there's that moment, that personal connection that anybody from a drug user to a health worker to a cop feels when somebody stopped breathing and then they give them this and they bring that, that thing. Now the question is, safe injection sites. There have been hundreds of thousands or millions of visits worldwide to safe injection sites. And to my knowledge, the number of overdose fatalities in a safe injection site is zero. Mm -hmm. Now you're right, it's a messaging issue, which is how do you communicate that, right? It, it lacks some of that drama because what you have is a nurse there. You don't have that interpersonal experience of thousands of people being engaged in that. The heroin maintenance one, you know, 60 Minutes, American 60 Minutes, about 12 years ago, they did a really good, they did a terrible thing on Needle Park, you know, the open drug scene behind the train station in Zurich in the early 90s. But then they did a great one, Ed Bradley, about heroin maintenance. And there was this scene, I and mean, whenever I tell the story, I tend to tear off the phone just because it's so powerful. But Ed Bradley sits down and he sits down, I can't remember if the police chief of Zurich was there who was explaining how he came around. But he sits down with uh, a woman in her probably late 20s um, and her parents. And the woman's in the program on prescription heroin, right, in the program, getting help from a, well, you know, think about methadone. Heroin maintenance is a very well-run methadone clinic where you can get both baseline methadone, methadone take home, as well as the heroin, you know, one to three times a day. And Ed Bradley asked the parents, what were you thinking? This is my recollection of this. What were you thinking? What were you feeling when you knew that your daughter was living on the streets engaged in prostitution and injecting drugs? And the parents look at one another and they say, the truth is, we wish she were dead. Because the horror, their vision that that life was a life worse than death. And then they look at their daughter, who's sitting there, right, alive. She's still taking that heroin two, three times a day. But she's robust, she's healthy, she's looking at them. They have their daughter, her daughter can have children, they can have grandchildren, all this sort of stuff. And they realize what they were saying. So the question is how you bring the emotional impact of the moment, right? I mean, that's the thing. The lock zone, needle exchange didn't really have that, right? Needle exchange had to grow without having that interpersonal moment right there. Because you never knew when that, in, that transmission was happening, right? And so it's always that question. The thing that's always been the challenge for us is that the imagery of the drug war has always been so much against us. The television cameras want to see the cops battering down doors, right? If they're showing injection drug use, they want to show them with sordid aspects, right? No, the TV programs like, hey, you want to see a well-run methadone program? Why? <laughs> Right? You want to see junkies selling half their methadone outside the door? Yeah, sure. Right? You, know, you want to see a Harold Maynard's program? Well, where's the action? Right? You know, I mean, that's one of the problems that we've had with this thing, right? And so naloxone brings that moment. It's what's so powerful, it opens up the door. We can't exactly replicate that with safe injection and heroin maintenance, but I will say that as for the cops, that interpersonal thing that's moving them now to want to get involved, and you've got to watch out how they do it and what they do with it, but it's a good thing. The heroin maintenance thing, when I've seen it now, when cops, that bulb goes off for them, it's partially intellectual, but what happens on a level, when they see people be transformed in that context, it's powerful, we just lacks that power. And I think naloxone's opening a door that broader harm reduction has to push through in the same way we tried to do with needle exchange. Let me take a bunch of questions, and then, then we'll wrap it up, and yes. I wanted to come back to the diminishing vocal role of the Uh, so the underlying rationale that you explain is that essentially because the drug problem in those countries is diminished, they have less of a need to take on a local role. So they've seen that they don't need to in, in order to move forward with the hard reduction efforts. So within that rationale, how do you fit in the most recent commission of narcotic drugs and the incredibly vocal stance they took against the death penalty, which doesn't affect their countries, but they still took that proactive stance and have their voice on the line, and do you think that whatever, what reason was behind that, and will that translate to other things? I gotta say, things? I feel with death penalty envy as a drug policy reformer, right? Because <laughs> I see amounts of money going into a death penalty ballot initiative um, that exceed anything we can do for criminal justice reform and drug policy reform, right? I see politicians bravely taking a stand in the public's against in some of these issues, right? And there's something, there's a power to that whole issue around the role of the state in taking a life and especially, I mean, I think it's been especially powerful in Europe because of their experience, you know, with World War II and all of that, uh, that mass system there. 
that there's power. And I think in the U.S. it has power. Now, I, I don't actually, I, I keep meaning to want to try to collect the evidence on this and not to be competitive with that movement, but it could well be the fact that the number of people who are dying as a result of their incarceration for drug law violations, dying in prison because they're in prison, whatever, exceeds any number of people being executed. In a year, right? Uh, and, and if you look at how do you measure, you know, X number of executions a year times 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 X number of incarceration, the, the, the two things you can't do. But I think the drug that definitely has a certain power, moral and personal and ideological power, that our thing, because it's different and more incremental in some doesn't. I think the Europeans are willing to be helpful. It's just that they're not willing to really, and they've been, they played the pivotal role. I mean, when nobody else is out there, it's been the CND, which is not about drug being, they were providing leadership, and they still will be helpful and good. But, but what happens is nobody's really galvanized on it. And I'm not sure how we make that happen. Yeah, so yes, <clears throat> The other thing about the European Union, which is a problem on harm reduction, is when the European Union engages at the UN, they have they, they, they follow a consensus. All the member states have to agree. So they have power as a block of countries. But when it comes to harm reduction, you've got the Swedes and the Italians, the UK now, uh, any number of countries who are just really shit on harm reduction. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's one of the help not getting. Yeah. I mean, still get individual countries who will speak up. I think one of the most important things we need to do with Sweden, basically, is to, for European progress, is to fuck with the Swedes internally. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's a growing number of people in Sweden who are actually coming along to the European sensibility on this stuff, and the Swedes are beginning to move a tiny bit, but that old line, they see themselves as playing that role, right? I mean, they are kind of like, they're almost like the Russians with the sweet face, and the, you know, the, 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 the I mean, not on the law enforcement side, but on a more restrictive thing. So, you know, uh, trying to open up that thing. What happened in Norway and Denmark, because they used to much more follow the Swedes, you know, as they peel off, and as, you know, the guy, the Norwegian guy in the Global Commission, Thorvald Stoltenberg, remarkable human being, you know, high level foreign minister, defense minister, all sorts of major roles, has three kids, right? One was the prime minister for a number of years until last year. The second is like the head of one of the major health ministries, and the third was a heroin addict for many years who just died a few months ago. Right, but I mean, she got better, but had trouble, right? Mm -hmm. But Thorvald Stoltenberg played this wonderful role in heading up the Norwegian Commission on Drugs, and then joining the Global Commission. He's now in his mid eighties, and just one of the, one of the great human being, mentally political leader of the world, right? You know, in Denmark, which used to follow more towards Scandinavia than Europe, they too moved along. Heroin maintenance. You know, you know, Switzerland, Germany, Netherlands, UK was doing research stuff and then you get into it. And the Danes started talking about doing their own heroin maintenance research study. And then finally, people in Denmark said, well, wait, why are we doing a research study? I mean, the evidence is already in from other countries. The Danes are not fundamentally different from the other Europeans. Why do we want to spend the money? Why do we want to delay? And by the way, how do we ethically construct, construct a control group that will not get heroin when every study to date is showing the group that got the pharmaceutical heroin did better than the one that did? So they just move forward, right? So today, I was just in Iceland, right, uh, a few months ago, right? 330,000 people, right? You do a TV interview, 20% of the country sees it, right? I, mean, I, I leave the TV on, and people are like, well, you know, I mean, you know, it's crazy, it's the middle, but it's a country. Like, right. You have a vote. <laughs> you know, they're going to see some law, but they, they see themselves as humanitarian, human rights leaders, and all this sort of stuff. But they got that Scandinavian prohibitionist thing that they because they were also outlaw prohibitionists, like you know. But I, I'm trying to arrange for Thorvald Stoltenberg now and Ruth Dreyfus, the Swiss president, to go there and do the thing, and then David Dodd, the, the British you know kind of expert, just was there and stirred up a lot of stuff. So I think that this could swing, right? So I, I think that we what Rick's saying, we gotta we gotta. Break out what remains it, because the EU posture which could be more progressive being held back by that. The recent change in the Italian government opens up a little bit of room, too. Yeah. Okay, hey. I suppose even if you go to look and say heroin prescribing, it's a European model of treatment, it's really internalism. Just so, so they can hear you back there. Yeah. I mean, Sweden is incredibly, it's not just prohibition, it's right. paternalistic. Yeah. And the Dutch are paternalistic. Yeah. The Swiss are paternalistic. And they actually like coercion. They like the ability to, if somebody deviates from yeah. the present path, and slap them back. Yeah. So at some point, we're going to run into this strong. I just want to hear thinking about how, you know, there's going to, is there going to come a moment when you, you can't really split the fact that some people in this movement are really libertarian 
and, and, and non agoraphobic and some of them are just really pragmatic and pragmatistic, right. and they like to still be able to punish people. Yeah, it's, not, it's all true. But the fact of the matter is that when Switzerland went from a couple of guys in Zurich and Bern, basically saying, let's give this a shot, and did the hundreds of meetings with all sorts of stakeholders, and got it going as a research trial, and then when Geneva joined in, and other cities began to join, and even little cities began to join in, and then when the police started to say why they thought this was a good thing, and researchers and politicians began to do it, and then they had a local referendum in Zurich, and uh, you know, there's a lot in the public engagement, and then it became national policy, and it got a national vote. The level of public education that happens through that process, in the end, there's only a few thousand people that exist on this program, right? And a lot of the zest and momentum is just kind of bogged down now for the reasons that you described. But that public education process that happened, and what happened, those little light bulbs going off in a whole, not just police chiefs, but a whole population, and the transformation of some understanding of addiction, the heuristic purposes, the heuristic accomplishment, right? The public education accomplishment of heroin maintenance is this huge thing, even though it ultimately affects a small number of people, and ultimately, they, they, you go to the Geneva heroin maintenance, and they can really get people to come because the control thing is so intense, right? But what it did was it transformed something there, you know? What I also don't know, by the way, because there's no evidence that I know of on this, I have a theory, a hypothesis, but I don't have evidence either way on it. I actually also wonder sometimes whether having a legal heroin maintenance program um, um, is, uh, is something that actually takes away a bit of dynamism of the illicit heroin market. But so long as people know that actually, if you can't cut it on the street anymore, it's not just methylbuprenorphine and drug-free treatment, you can actually go get heroin if you want to play by the government's rules. I actually think it maybe has a kind of um, dampening impact on, in a positive public health and public safety way, and I can't prove it, you know? I suppose I should acknowledge sitting here, by the way, is Peter Balenson over here. Peter, just raise your hand for a second, who was the health commissioner of Baltimore for, uh, for, for many years. And Peter, I have to tell you, I was telling you before, uh, a few days ago we had Kurt Schmoke, the former mayor of Baltimore, come to my EPA policy retreat. And somebody asked uh, about heroin maintenance, Venga asked about heroin maintenance. And Kurt, it brought up this story, because Peter was trying to move forward, as I, I may have the story slightly wrong, but Peter was the only health commissioner in America who wanted to move this thing forward. And Johns Hopkins was already giving heroin to people, not in a Mason's experiment, but other things, and I think you may have made a verbal slip. He, Peter stood up and said, we're going to try to move forward with this. He meant by we, the city of Baltimore, but he's a health commissioner. And so the mayor, and we have put Kurt was sort of in favor for it, and Kurt says, yeah, I had to get Peter, they can walk the uh, thing on that. But Peter had the guts to try to do this and move it forward. And part of what's going to move forward is people who have the guts and the political savvy, you know, to try to do what Peter tried to do back in Baltimore in the 90s. So I think it's going to take that kind of leadership, and it will be worth it, even if it comes to that kind of thing. Um, I, yeah, I, I should, well, okay, you're here. Okay, yeah, go ahead. To so speak up so they can hear you. Before I came in here, I stopped and sell on A to listen to the Bill Conference of Analog Chronic Pain and Harm Reduction and Missing Link. Frankly, because I'm sick to death of hearing about the prescription opioid epidemic. It just makes me crazy. And um, in that vein, and it also touches on what Howard was starting to say, what I, I'm almost wanting to hear us talk about the economy as a human right. About what? Uh, about euthymia as a human right. Euthymia. Yeah, as a human right. Without going there, what I'm trying to say is that my personal moment uh, around some of those things was in the 90s and, and encountering you know, young people from 15 to 25, let's say, in the range, coming into my office over and over and over again who had their initial exposure to pharmaceutical opioids somewhere, somehow. And for the first times in their lives, you know, felt you know, strangely comfortable in their skins in the world. Yeah. A little like the sort of Bill Wilson moment. Yeah. You know. But I heard it over and over and over again. And you know, it just it just is something to that that we're not here. Yeah. No, you know, it has to do with the I think that's a fantastic point. I don't know where you find it. Um, but oh, it just means uh, well-being. 
But, well, so, uh, yeah. yeah, I, I think it's a particularly important point because the the issue of the opiates, in that sense, this is even harder to talk. And I'll say to people, you know, what are the two drugs where, and it's obviously more, but the two most frequent ones where you hear people say that the first time they took it or the first time they felt better right. was the first time they felt normal. Yeah, uh, that's how. And what was it? Prozac and heroin, essentially. Prozac and heroin. And, and so I think that's exactly right. I think you're right. That discussion needs to be put out for much, much more. I really agree with that. I think we should actually break because it is. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks to one person who's watching. I'll be back. It's a bad deal.